There's also another really important change that's taking place, which is mass of rise in education. So now when you talk about, uh, so you know, in, in my father's day, for example, someone getting education is very, very rare. The vast majority of, of people were illiterate or semi-literate or simply had access either to the Bible or the Quran. Now, this is no longer the case. Lebanon, even the women, I think 92% of the women are now illiterate. There is massive amount of education. I always, I always tell this, I made a mistake last time, because I told the joke in, in Cambridge to a load of Saudi students. There were five minutes to go, okay, great. <laughs> yeah, just in the introduction. Um, in, uh, and, which is, we always used to laugh in Lebanon, because we always felt ourselves to be much more educated than everyone else. Well, the stories of the Saudis' newfound wealth, uh, of the Saudi who bought a car, drove it, ran out of petrol, didn't realise he had to refill it with petrol, so simply abandoned it and bought another car and all the Lebanese laughed, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I know this idea of these kind of people coming out of the desert with no real kind of knowledge. No one says that about Saudis anymore. The Saudis are extraordinarily well educated. And you meet the young Saudis, in fact, the Saudis I spoke to, and then they were laughing at me afterwards, they were going, you know, we, we, was it? we all work for a, biology, uh, a, a firm that specialises in the biology of cancer, you know, like, okay, <laughs> you know, it's much more educated than that. Actually, there is this new generation, extraordinarily educated, but at the same time with no real uh, sense of any achievement that, you, that, that, that they can achieve anything. And when we look at the Arab ruling class, we'll also see very, very important shifts, and I think this is really important to understand. It's as well. In 1933, when the Americans discovered oil in Saudi Arabia, they went up to the king, Ibn al-Saud, and they said to him, how much do you want for us to take oil? How much shall we give you? And he just thought, you know, it's one of these things. Oh, I'll have $30,000 in gold, because that seems like a lot of money. And, he, and you're kind of, everyone laughs at it now, because then, they, of course, they made super profits out of this, out of this oil. The Americans founded this company called Aramco, Arab American Oil Company, in which they brought Standard Oil, California, and various others to Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they made what they called super profits. It was one of the really big, you know, cash cows of, of the US economy. Aramco is now owned by Saudi Arabia, and it's called Saudi Aramco, and it is the biggest company in the world. It's the richest company in the world, not simply in the oil they control, but all the production downstream as well. And so when you think about the rise of Arab capitalism, and Arab capitalism is nowhere near in any way what it was 10 or 15 years ago. And you just think about the Emirates Stadium. You know, it isn't like people in North London have this kind of love of, you know, people in the United Arab Emirates, that they call their football stadium after it. It's actually because it's the money that's coming in. Uh, if you think of the rich, the Arab rich, having control over large sections of modern capitalism, not simply uh, things like Apple, which is uh, a large chunk of it is, is, is owned by a, 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 a Saudi prince, but also all the kind of major projects. So when we talk about now Arab capitalism, we don't simply see it as being these kind of poor, semi-literate sheikhs you know, needing the Americans and being tricked by the Americans. Actually, it's, that's completely shifted. When you talk about Arab wealth and the wealth emerging out of these regions, it's huge, massive, massive amounts of wealth. So the relationship, if you like, between the sort of global ruling class or Western ruling class, if you want to call it, and the Arab ruling class is now no longer one of one looking down on the other. It's actually the other way around in, 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 in lots of ways. We, we always laugh because people say, you know how rich David Cameron is. You know, they all come from Eton. Pfft, nothing. Hosni Mubarak had $80 billion in his bank account. And when people go, oh, you know, that's a lie, he didn't have $80 billion in his bank account, only had $20 billion. Oh, right, so he only had $20 billion. Mm -hmm. Muammar Gaddafi, in his bank account, had $500 billion. Now, you can imagine, $500 billion would solve one of the big problems of the American administration, because that's their shortfall for actually running the state. And you start thinking about this, and you think about the, the way the Saudi ruling class reacted to the Egyptian revolution. They pumped something like $300 billion into their economy. You want housing, you want anything you want, you do it. Because actually there's a massive amount of wealth in the Arab world, in a way that there wasn't when I was younger, and in which the society has changed dramatically. And the relationship between imperialism and these countries has also shifted uh, dramatically as well. Of course, you know, Saudi Arabia, despite its wealth, hasn't got an army like the Americans. I'm not saying it's on par on that level. But to think of them simply as being you know, this, this, this kind of backwaters, it's no longer the case. I mean, anyone looking at United Arab Emirates now and see you know, these gleaming cows and so on, I understand that this is no longer the case. So we have a population that's shifted and changed in its structure, urban, educated, uh, wanting something better. The regime's extraordinarily wealthy, very, very wealthy, but the difference between the two getting massive 
and bigger and bigger and bigger. So before the revolution, you can look at the wealth of the uh, richest Arab 50 families, you know, and you're just like, that would have solved the economic crisis inside of Egypt. This was how bad, how, how bad it was. The regimes themselves, before the revolutions, were regimes that emerged out of that old era. So if people think of all the figures inside the Arab world, Muammar Gaddafi took power in 1968, when it was you know, a, a desert country, I've seen nothing in it. Uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafs al-Assad, took power in 1970. Mubarak took power in what, 19, 1979, 1980. That all, every single regime, all the leadership of these regime, were from a different era. In which emerged out of a completely different era that did not reflect the changes, the massive changes, not only in the global level but also in their, in their, in their social level. So you can talk about the revolutions not simply being something, this sudden expression of, you know, after 30 years, oh shit, let's go out and beat up the policemen. It was actually something that was building up, unable to, these regimes, unable to reform, unable to meet the demands of the people, and unable to adapt themselves to the massive social shifts that were taking place inside the area, it actually meant that the question of reform, the question of small changes, is no longer an option. There had to be these big changes. And so the, 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 the pressure keg, if you like, that brought, that came to these, why suddenly they just went from one border to another, they crossed from here to there and so on. You have to understand it in terms of these massive social changes and these very, very uh, uh, fragile but nasty regimes. There is a, I'm just going to go over it a little bit, if, if, if that's okay. The, there is an, another aspect to this, which I also think is important to understand which is the relationship between Israel and imperialism, also, that's also significantly changed. Uh, Israel, uh, in the 1960s, when you looked in, if you compare Israel with the rest of the Western countries, it had the smallest difference between the rich and the poor. So it was, it was quite true, if you're Jewish in Israel, you live in a pretty much an egalitarian society, that's true. There was very little disparity between the rich and the poor uh, that, 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 that took place. Put Israel then in relation to Egypt, or Syria or Jordan, actually they were well and truly advanced and much more educated and so on. And so when they fought the wars in 1967 and 1973, even in 1982, it was a much more educated, sophisticated people facing a bunch of peasants. Really, that's, you know, I don't want to put my people down, but I will in, 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 in these terms. And when Israel, and now when you look at Israel, there's something else, something has changed. Because all the years of neoliberalism actually meant that if you now compare Israel with the rest of the Western countries, it has the highest difference between the rich and the poor. So it's, if, if, if you like, when you look at Israel itself, it resembles much more the Arab regimes than it, is, than it does the, the, the Western countries. So Israel itself has become very, very fragile as well, internally extraordinarily fra 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 fragile. And the Arab revolutions have changed another equation for imperialism, which I think is really important that we understand. You see, when Israel made the peace deal with Egypt, first in uh, 1977, 1978, and then in 1982, uh, pre the deal, pre, pre the peace deal, something like 29% of the gross domestic product had to go into the military. Why? Because there's 5 million Israelis, and he looks south, and there's 82 million Egyptians. Most of the time, they're pretty angry. You know, so you think, what is it we need to keep a population of 85 million at bay? So they have to build their military in order to face this potential threat from, I'm going to talk about Egypt, just, just to give you a sense of what Egypt is. There's more people live in Cairo than all of Syria. There's more people live in Alexandria than all of Lebanon. Just to give you a sense of the scale, when we talk about Egypt, we talk very, very big. And when we talk about Lebanon, we talk about almost as the population the size of, of, of a small Egyptian city. When the Israelis made the deal with the peace deal, they shifted their army from the south and invaded Lebanon. They took out, smashed, tried to smash up Lebanon, and they took on Syria. They failed. Actually, they lost the war in Lebanon, first in 2000, and then again in 2006. So even pre-revolution, the Israelis were going, actually, this is not as easy as we thought it was. And when they started to face, especially the Hezbollah fighters in the south, they were no longer facing peasants, but people who had gone to university. So when, when, when I was reporting the war in, 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 in the south of Lebanon in 2006, I was quite shocked to discover not only that most Hezbollah, Hezbollah fighters speak English, most of them had engineering degrees, but they also had Hebrew speakers with them. So that was like, you know, very different to the people they fought even 20 years ago who were essentially peasants. Um, and, and so all these ships actually meant that Israel was in an extraordinarily weak position. Come the Arab revolutions, the Israelis uh, 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 now find themselves extraordinarily isolated. 
and in an extraordinarily fragile position. And an Israeli journalist, I think, put it really well. I think it was day three after Hassan Mubarak fell. Uh, they said, we are now in strategic distress because we have lost the main, our main ally in the south. We've lost a person who was closing the gate to the Gaza Strip on the south. We now have to face, now we have to contend with an extraordinarily angry Egyptian people who, at the drop of a hat, suddenly invaded their embassy and tore it apart, something that hasn't happened for a very, very, very long time. And so the Israelis are now pulling back. The Americans feel extraordinarily weak. And so in these conditions, then we can say, okay, fantastic, let's all go home. That's the end of that. You know, we'll start importing Chinese goods and goodbye imperialism. But that is probably being a little bit too, uh, uh, too, too optimistic because it now both US imperialism but also Western imperialism has to try and attempt to find its way back in. They have to attempt to try and manage the revolutions and they're using two strategies. And I will, I will finish on this. Sorry, I won't be quick one anymore. The first, all, first one is after Tahrir Square, after the massive Egyptian revolution, uh, in which if they could kiss the revolution to death, they will. It's like, we love you, you're so wonderful, it's an express, you know, so, 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 the, the, you know, so we had David Cameron walking to Tahrir Square, you know, trying to, trying to love up to the revolution, basically, right? essentially what, what, what they were doing, and trying to control it and multicolor it and, 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 and try and have some, some kind of control over it. With this includes telling the Israelis to shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. So when the Egyptians, when Gaza, that had been under siege, remember, uh, said, we want Egypt to now supply us, we don't have enough fuel, Egypt supply us with fuel. The Egyptians went, yes, we'll supply you with fuel. The Israelis went, okay then. That's it, you know. So now, the Egypts, they can no longer control Gaza. They can no longer control, control the southern gate of Gaza. So they're trying to find ways, if you like, of drawing it in. And, and, and so when you see this, the way they're working inside of, uh, inside of uh, both Tunisia and the Egyptian Revolution, let me see the other aspect of it. Their attempt to militarily get involved, and we saw this in Libya. The Libyan Revolution broke out. The Libyan Revolution was on the verge of defeat. They, they found a way. Again, it wasn't the Americans. This was the French and the British. The Americans are still feeling too weak to do it, of trying to place themselves inside of Libya by helping the revolution, as they say, and then putting themselves in between the Tunisian Revolution and the Egyptian Revolution. So, they, so that there is both this kind of multi-coupling element to it, but also the, 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 the stepping in and trying to hijack a revolution, which, is, which they're trying to do as well inside of, inside, of, inside of Libya. So when we understand a mass of social changes, the shifts in the nature of the Arab regimes, the Arab ruling class, and the wealth of the Arab ruling class, and their interaction as being part of global capitalism, the weakening of US imperialism, and the rise of China, we can actually begin to see that the imperialism is going through one of, its, uh, one of its tectonic shifts, of which we don't know what the result is going to be.